This is the business portion of the meeting. Good evening. Today is May 11th, 2021. The board meeting was called to order today at 5.30 p.m. with the board going directly into executive session under ORS 192.6602D to conduct deliberations with persons designated to carry on labor negotiations. And ORS 192.6602E to conduct deliberations with persons designated to negotiate real property transaction. This executive session was announced in advance on Friday, May 7, 2021, both by listing it on the agenda and posting it online. Executive sessions are not open to the public. It's now a minute past 6 p.m. or 6 p.m. And we are reconvening our meeting with the public session, which is our regular business meeting. Tonight's meeting is a hybrid meeting with most of our board members in person and Director Blasi and Director Hein joining us online and Vice Chair Bethel will not be joining us. She's Only board members and designated staff are in the boardroom. Public access is online and this meeting is being simultaneously broadcasted uh, via CC Media, Channel 21, and YouTube. So we had taken the board attendance earlier, and I'm just going to make sure if everybody is still present. Director Kylo? Here. Director Hein? Here. Director Lepol Pion? Present. Director Blasi? Here. Director Goss? Here. Advisor Mebinton? Here. And Satya Chandragiri Chair, I'm present. Vice Chair Bethel is excused. Thank you. I'm going to request Director Goss to read the land acknowledgement. Director Goss, please. Thank you, Chair Chandragiri. It's my pleasure to do so. Acknowledgement is critical in building the necessary trust to coexist in harmony with one another. Indigenous tribes and bands have been apparent on the lands of the Willamette Valley, across Oregon, and throughout the Americas since time immemorial. In this valley, the ancestry of the Kalapuya reaches the furthest back in time, reminding us that this plentiful place has been called home by its original inhabitants long before the names of the snowy peaks and bountiful waters were re-identified. Today we acknowledge that the people of this land still exist and inhabit this valley, not as heirs to it or as artifacts, but as reciprocal contributors to the modern society we live in. We forward our respect to the first peoples of this land, the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon and those who have ceded their lands here. We reflect on the displacement removal, and genocide of indigenous people that occurred throughout Oregon and beyond. In so doing, we truly honor the gravity of the past and endeavor to see that people may live in harmony and equity on this land for posterity. May this acknowledgement carry resonance as a tool of peace over the land and waters we mutually rely upon. Please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Goss. Will you please stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. There's no agenda modifications, I see. The next uh, item number three, spotlights. Superintendent Perry, you. 
All right, our uh, first uh, community spotlight tonight is going to be presented by Jody Peterson, our coordinator of health services management, and she'll be presenting our community partner of the month. Bryce. All right, uh, our next spotlight is going to be presented by uh, Principal Laura Tiffin from South Salem High School. Hi, Principal Tiffin. students make all the final content choices and uh, the award is given to high schools that demonstrate excellence in supporting teaching and protecting First Amendment rights and responsibilities this is the second time that Clippian has won the award and the second time that South Salem High School has been named a press freedom school we also received these two awards in 2019 and we're the only school in Oregon to ever receive the awards. This kind of success doesn't happen by accident, which is why I'd like to recognize teacher Brian Erickson, the advisor to our journalism program. Under Mr. Erickson's leadership, the Clippian has had three South Salem students named Oregon Journalist of the Year, Eddie Benford Ross in 2021, Tucker Conlu in 2016 and Rachel Mesa Rojas in 2014. 
I'd also like to thank Mr. Erickson and his students for all of the extra hours and the late nights they put into live broadcasting uh, um, our students' sporting events. They are on the cutting edge of student broadcasting with all of their work. At South Salem High School, we're incredibly proud of our long legacy of fostering student journalism. We are incredibly grateful for the high caliber work of our students and of Mr. Erickson. So my congratulations to all of you who are on this call tonight. Keep up the great work, Saxons, and thank you. Yeah, congratulations, Eddie, and to the whole uh, South Salem High School journalism class. Thank you, Principal Tiffin. All right, our last spotlight tonight is going to be presented by Assistant Superintendent Ifan Udosnata, Oregon High School Principal of the Year, 2021. Good evening, Chair Shonda Gary and board members. It's my pleasure tonight to honor Principal Eric Jesperson from McNary High School, who was recently named the Oregon 2021 High School Principal of the Year Award by the Oregon Association of Secondary School Administrators and the Coalition of Oregon School Administrators. Principal Jesperson has led McNary for seven years now and has seen students flourish under his leadership. He's committed to approaching projects at his school through an equity lens. During the pandemic, he worked tirelessly to make sure that all students are supported, including students who need additional help to succeed. Since he became principal, McNary's graduation rate has risen from 82% in 2014 to 92% in 2020. Even more impressively, McNary's graduation rates for students receiving special services has risen from 54% to 82.5%, and for Latinx students from 66% to 92.6%. Principal Jesperson excuse me, started McNary's one-to-one-to-one, -one -to -one, or one-one-one initiative, which makes sure students are engaged with either a school community, or through, in the school community through participation in at least one club, one activity, or one sports uh, event each school year. Working with this amazing staff, he also led the, the remodel of McNary's College and Career Center through the Nike School Innovation Fund grant, creating a hub to ensure students have, have a, a plan for after graduation. Last year, McNary graduated, graduates earned more than $10 million in scholarships. Principal Jesperson will be honored at the annual COSA Seaside Conference in June and at the COSA Principals Conference in October. We are proud to have uh, leaders like Eric Jesperson in our district. Congratulations on receiving this well-deserved honor by your peers across the state, recognizing your commitment and hard work, and also you're a, great, uh, you're a great leader for our school district, and I just want you to know that, Mr. Jesperson. So thank you, and go Sells. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Congratulations, Principal Jesperson. We are uh, truly honored because you're world class. How about that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Very All honored. Right. Yep. And, and uh, congratulations to the kids at the Clippian too. That, uh, as, as a principal of another high school, they're, they're pretty amazing. We have a lot of respect for the work they've done. So good job, kids, if you're still on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Perry. Those are wonderful. Yeah. Now the next uh, item number four is the public comments. And board members received all the public comments to review yesterday. We get about close, to, we got all the written comments and the summary will be posted on our website by tomorrow. And uh, I'm going to request uh, Sylvia McDaniel, Director of Communications and Community Relationship to read the summary of the public comments. Well, Hello. Just, uh, just this format has helped us close to get about 30 hours to sit and read and be prepared when we come to the board meeting. So I really appreciate this opportunity for us to read and understand. We also got some feedback from different communities, including leaders from our community who felt that this has helped them you know, submit their comment, and they have also felt that uh, you know it's fairly equitable, and they also get an opportunity to submit. So thank you very much. 
Thank you, Chair Chandra Gary, Superintendent Perry. A uh, summary of our public comments for May 11th. We had three written comments, a total of three, and the topics were on trackers for students, face masks, handling of COVID-19 and the equity lens. For the trackers for students, we had one comment. Uh, Jervis has invested in trackers for students. Writers feel this is not a good thing. Students need the freedom to be kids and not to be tracked. Please do not consider this. On the face masks, one comment. Uh, right, the writer said, would like face masks to not be a requirement for 21-22. But if they are, please consider face shields. Students struggle to learn with masks on and research shows it is not necessary for children to wear them at all. Handling of COVID-19, one comment. Uh, writer feels this was handled badly by the school district. You are not providing a good education. Writer has students in an alternative education program, but the parents that cannot afford to do this are really paying the highest price. For the equity lens, we had one comment. Writer opposes the ideology of our current equity lens, feels it teaches racism and does not address it. We were all taught to treat people equally. We are sowing racism with this version of the equity lens. That is the comments, written comments for this evening. Thank you, Director okay. McDaniel. Yes. Superintendent Perry, the next portion uh, section is on reports. All right, so um, I'm just going to give you, and you can go ahead and share screen. I've got a, just a few slides as reports. I've got a little bit of data in this data report, but I'm not going to go through it in any depth because we do have um, a full report in June. But this is a follow-up to last meeting when we asked the question of, Uh, when we asked the question, um, what will, how do we monitor kids in um, this distance learning environment when we know there has been um, some difficulties and gains? So I'm just sharing, gonna share that snapshot with you to remind you that we do do it. Um, so uh, first of all, um, one of the things we've been talking about in uh, special education is around recovery services. So you'll start to hear that. Um, that terminology, recovery services. This is for uh, students with disabilities who through their IEP process uh, may need some additional services as a result of COVID. But I just wanna tell you what we um, did during this time to kind of start gathering information. So uh, the special education department launched on a um, kind of listening tour with parents. So they've gone out to get some feedback from parents. They had six sessions in English, two in Spanish, one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one uh, phone calls for all other languages. Um, they, the topics they addressed is what is recovery, equity as an outcome and an action, steps taken to mitigate the impact, and then current ideas for recovery. And then they have breakout sessions to talk through um, questions. Uh, so then um, they, um, in the breakout groups, they did the greatest areas of impact or concern from parents, ideas for whole school or whole district recovery options, and ideas to support those most disproportionately impacted. Um, and then here's what's interesting about what we, we learned. We were thinking that we would learn that our uh, parents at secondary would be concerned about academics, just the opposite. So our secondary uh, parents, these are our parents of students with disabilities, were most concerned about social opportunities. Elementary, from the feedback we got is equally concerned with social and academics. Parents really wanted this summer social opportunities where kids can be kids, um, at, especially at that secondary level. Remember that our summer school grants though have to be tied to academics and credit recovery or we don't get the dollars for summer school. So we're trying to pair at that secondary level not only some credit recovery but some fun social uh, things at the same time. 
And then uh, parents also understood the potential constraints for recovery, and they had deep discussions. They understood that some kids may need more than other kids in recovery services. So just a huge shout out to our uh, special education department who did this. I think they got to about 200 families um, in the last couple weeks. Um, just a reminder about how we are assessing our students during COVID, even without state assessments. We're doing easy CBM reading K through five, fall, winter, spring, K five, I ready math, fall, winter, spring, and then I ready six through eight reading and math, fall and winter. Both the I ready and easy CBM are nationally normed. So the question came up last time about, are you giving nationally normed tests? These are uh, more nationally normed at this point than the state assessment would have been. Um, just a quick snapshot from, um, of the types of data. And then this is data is all broken down by race, ethnicity, students with disabilities. And we can then um, really target what does the student need based on this. Um, so as you can see by um, grade level, that was, was what our uh, winter distribution looked like. The bigger area of concern is in the uh, grade five. You can see there's more red in grade four and five. This is I ready math. Um, I ready, uh, this is middle school math. Again, really uh, looking at math as one of those areas that we're really going to have to tackle in our, um, as we're thinking about recovery and learning loss for our students. Also, when we break this down, we learn some things about which uh, groups of students have been disproportionately impacted. Uh, the good news is we're not waiting for state assessments to get back. Uh, and then uh, this is uh, I ready reading uh, for middle school as well. We'll prepare a full report for you in June. That was one of our uh, KPI reports that we wanted um, to share with you, but I just didn't want you to leave last time um, thinking that we weren't assessing our students or for our community to think we weren't assessing our students. Um, so with that, I'm gonna walk, uh, we're gonna walk into a number of reports and uh, we're gonna do a transition to hybrid learning report. Uh, Dr. West is going to um, present that report. Part of that will be a quick share out about summer and looking into next year. Uh, Dr. West has uh, been hired as our new director of strategic initiatives and she is replacing uh, Jim Orth in that position. So I think this might be our first time to present to the board. Um, from that, we'll go into um, a number of other reports, um, Student Success Act and our reimagining school discipline. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. West, and then um, when we get to the end, we'll open it up for questions. Excellent. Thank you, Superintendent Perry, Chair Chandra Geary, directors. Nice to see you all tonight. Um, so I have a few things to share with you, and I'm going to do my best to do this with a mouse and not an actual clicker. Look at that, it worked, all right. <laughs> okay, so starting with uh, Ready School Safe Learner updates, um, just a reminder that we're operating under the most recent guidance, which came out in April. We're expecting new guidance in July. What that means for us is that we will be operating as we are right now, at least through the end of the school year. We don't anticipate any changes. We have seen metrics fluctuate a little bit. The good news is they've improved. So up until the 13th of May, Marion and Polk counties were actually considered extreme risk. On the 13th of May, they changed to high risk. That does give us a little bit of flexibility in terms of what size groups we can bring together in certain spaces. So that's a great thing for us. Um, and as a side note, I just read a few hours ago that the governor announced some new potential metrics um, that she's considering actually using vaccine rates to change risk levels um, going forward. So that could have big implications for us as a school district, especially as we enter into the next school year. Um, speaking of which, we are planning for a five-day-per-week in-person school near, year next year, and that will be a full day of instruction, just like we experienced before. But along with that, we anticipate that there will be some health and safety protocols that we still need to follow. For example, we anticipate that we'll still need to follow protocols such as masks, hand washing, hand sanitization, maybe some social distancing in some circumstances, um, but we're pretty excited to be able to plan for five days a week instruction. 
and our school leaders and our district leaders are taking the steps right now to make sure that our spaces will actually accommodate that given the guidance that we have in place. We are also planning to continue our EDGE program into the next school year and we're really excited about that. Um, the registration window for EDGE is currently open right now. It will be open until this Friday, May 14th. Any family that registers before May 14th is guaranteed a spot in our EDGE program. So anyone watching who is interested, we encourage, whoa. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we encourage you to uh, um, go ahead and go to our website and actually enroll your students in the program. Um, because again, spots are guaranteed through Friday, May 14th. After the 14th of May, it's on an available um, space basis only. Next year, we're offering two different options for our EDGE students. Option one is EDGE independent. And this option will be for students that really want to work at their own pace, that want to set their own schedule, that if they're young, maybe have family support at home. If they're an older student, maybe they have some other obligations that they need to work around. Um, so we're excited to be able to offer that option for our students. They will have regular touch points with an actual teacher, but it won't be on a daily basis. Edge Connected will be more like traditional school and more like what students experience this year, where they are actually connecting with the teacher every single day. They have a live session every day. They have a schedule very similar to what you would see in a traditional school environment, greater structure. Um, throughout their school year. So far, we're pretty encouraged by those who have enrolled. As of this morning, we have 932 students that have indicated their preference for EDGE. Of those, 387 are elementary, 273 are middle, and 272 are high school students. So interest in our EDGE program remains strong, even with families knowing that we will be returning to five day per week in person instruction. As we talk about hybrid learning, we would be remiss to not acknowledge the effort of our operation colleagues because we wouldn't be able to do this without them. And when we talk about operations, we mean our transportation, custodial, food and technology services, along with our contractors who are supporting us with the bond work. And just some examples, you've heard some of these statistics before, but they've grown since the last time you've heard them. As an example, our transportation department, they transport about 24,000 students every single week, um, fluctuates a little bit, but that's their average. Our custodians are integral in making sure that we can meet health and safety protocols. Food services shared with me last week that if you combine our grab and go meals, as well as those that have been served in person now, They've served more than 2.3 million meals this year. That's pretty incredible. Our technology services continues to support hybrid learning. And as you heard recently, they're planning to collect all of our Chromebooks at the end of the school year, service and maintenance those Chromebooks for redeployment in the fall so that we can continue our one-to-one -one student to device initiative. And then the bond work that's being completed by our contractors is really quite incredible and quite expansive across the district. So we have 14 schools where the bond work is completed, which is worth celebrating. This summer, we'll have 24 schools under construction. 11 of those school campuses will be completely closed because of how extensive the construction is. And 11 more will be partially closed and only the offices will be open. And that's important to note because that will impact and has impacted some of our summer school planning, which I'll talk about next. So we do plan to have summer school at all levels. As you can see there, the dates are laid out. All students will have access to summer school options. Many students will have multiple options. Summer school will be held at select locations. And what that means for our students is that Although they will have the opportunity to attend summer school, it may not be at their neighborhood school. Um, now, in order to make sure that every student actually still can attend whatever summer program that they like, we will be providing transportation. And those of our colleagues who are in the process of planning summer school are working really hard to make sure that that, that remains an option for all of our students. 
So that's underway. In addition to the academic programs that Superintendent Perry mentioned just previously, we also plan to offer several enrichment programs this summer that students can opt into. Some of those enrichment programs include a Japanese culture camp, a community um, education theater, construction camps, robotic camps, um, and many, many, many more options that we think for our students um, will provide them a lot of fun and excitement, opportunities just to be kids, like we heard in the previous report from Superintendent Perry, as well as provide them the academic supports that they need to finish any learning that was missed during the school year. A few quick reports from each of the different levels. As I said before, all levels are still in hybrid learning and we will continue that through the end of the school year. There's about six weeks left in the school year and the goal at every level is to finish strong. So that is the focus right now of our school-based staff and our school-based leaders. A couple of things to note at the elementary level, in addition to finishing strong, our school teams are working really hard to find ways to celebrate kids in ways that meet the health and safety protocols before the end of the school year. So some of the things that are underway right now in terms of planning are virtual celebrations because we can't invite families onto our campuses. We're looking for ways to include them in celebrations of their students in a virtual capacity. We're looking at offering field days at our elementary schools in ways, again, that meet health and safety protocols that will allow kids on the last day or so of school to just enjoy their school experience for the year. And then what many schools are looking at doing is what's called a clap out. And for those of you who haven't experienced this before, a clap out is where fifth grade students on their last day of school, as they exit the building for the last time, are clapped out by their classmates and the school, school staff. It's really a powerful emotional experience for those who participate in it, especially our fifth graders, and it's a nice way to send them off to sixth grade. So again, teams are deep, deeply planning to make sure that we can do that in a way that meets health and safety protocols. At the middle level, there's a couple of exciting things to report. So we have at the middle level right now, 775 students that are participating in athletics. This is the last season of athletics for the middle level, and it includes things like football and volleyball. In addition, as you can see on the graphic up there, we have at the middle level our school leaders and school teams engaging deeply around connection and enrichment opportunities for our students and, and how to give as many students as possible access to those opportunities. So what you see there is a sample club schedule from Leslie Middle School. Across all of our middle schools, we have approximately 1,000 students that are taking advantage of these different clubs and different enrichment opportunities. And it's proving a really nice way for kids to connect with others who have like interests and connect with adults who can shepherd them through those interests and form those strong bonds that will, we know, ultimately lead to success in later school years. At the high school level, we have OSAA activities underway. Season three is just about to wrap up. And you can see that season three included our traditional spring sports. Season four started yesterday. So we're in our final season of athletics at the high school level. And we're pretty excited, even though the seasons were modified and they were shorter, that we were still able to offer our students an opportunity to engage in those activities that for many of them make their high school experience. So that concludes the hybrid learning update. What questions may I answer for you? Thank you. Shall we start with the advice of Mabinton? Do you have a question? No, I don't have a question, but I think Edge Independent is a really good idea, so I'm excited about that. Thank I'm you. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks. Director Lepolpion. Uh, yeah, I have two of them. One of them is with uh, edge independent and then edge connected. First of all, I agree with uh, you know Advisor Mbinton. I think that's really awesome. What are we doing to explain this to parents and students so that they know what their options are and what that could look like for them? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, first, definite shout out to our communications team. 
Um, they have done an outstanding job of supporting our EDGE principals in holding community forums, in sharing information via email and other channels, um, hosting drop-in sessions where families can ask questions. In fact, I think there's one tonight or this afternoon that took place. Um, so we've been engaging for the last two weeks and will continue to engage through this week. Um, one of the efforts, for example, that's underway this week, and I think this was initiated today as well, is that for those families who are currently participating in EDGE that have not yet indicated their preference, we are sending them a parent view activation to make sure that they're able to actually get into the registration system. We're contacting them directly to remind them that this is the week to indicate their preference. And then we're making ourselves available to make sure that we can answer questions. So our EDGE leaders have really been intentional about reaching out not only to their existing families, but making sure that that communication goes out broadly across our organization. Thank you. Thank Director you. Kylo, do you have a question? Oh, you have another question? Yeah, the second part to that question was, because um, EDGE Independent seems like a pretty cool program. Have we had a conversations with families who maybe aren't involved with our district at all, that are homeschooling? Yes. To see if this can better meet their needs? Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, we, we are reaching out to those families as well, those that we know of. So we, we do know some of our homeschool families. We also know some families that are engaged in other online um, communities. We do get that information from our ESD. Um, so we have reached out to them directly and will continue to do so to invite them to participate. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Director Kylo. Director Goss, do you have a question? I was wondering about the, the swimming in the traditional winter sports. Where are we finding places for that? Yeah. That's a great question. They uh, primarily swim at the Croc Center for Croc practice. Croc okay. That's it. Thank I you. Understand. Director Hyen, do you have a question? No, no I don't. Thank you. Director Blasi, do you have a question? This is one uh, for educated is If that's if their own age, does that mean they can complete the, the year or the semester early? And if so, how does that impact yeah, that's a great question. I actually did talk to our edge, a couple of our edge administrators about that not too long ago. Um, it's still being looked at how we do that because we're still tied to terms as a school system. And so we, we need to report grades within that term structure. Um, and you're right, we do have some assessment um, obligations that we need to meet, some that aren't set by us. Um, so we're trying to figure out what that could look like for some of our students. Um, it might end up looking like early graduation in some cases, it, um, which we have opportunities for in our traditional high schools as well. Um, but we don't have all of those details worked out just yet. It, it's still under development. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Now, it, it's EDGE program and the uh, five-day week or the model we will have are they comparable academic uh, levels or this you know the course that's given in both these models are they comparable whether it's edge independent edge connected and in person learning okay i think i understand the question so are they comparable in terms of the classes available and the level of rigor is and the level of rigor and the standard that is expected for that each grade level yes yeah, so the level of rigor and the standards that are expected for each level are comparable. The actual classes available may not be. Um, we're using online curriculum that doesn't have necessarily a one-to-one -one match in our traditional high school environments, and that's something that our EDGE administrators have worked hard to try to overcome this past year, but we haven't found a way to overcome all of the courses that are traditionally offered in a physical high school environment and offer those same courses in a digital environment. So similar to the question about how do we move kids at their own rate if they're moving faster than the term, this is a question that we're still working on answering. Can I ask a, a follow-up on that? So if, yeah. a, if a student 
is interested in an online class which is not offered in our district through the EDGE program, can they sign up for a similar class in another district just for that class, and do we make exceptions from an equity point of view? Yeah, we students can't cross-enroll in districts because of how state funding works. Got it. Um, what some students do um, is that they may take an online class, especially our older students, through a university. And there are ways that we can help transcript that for students, but cross-enrollments in districts we cannot do. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. West. Superintendent Perry. All right. Uh, next up is Dr. Udos Nata, who's going to uh, do reimagining school discipline, student safety and well-being, and also then we'll move right into the Student Success Act. And thank you for giving me a moment to set up the presentation. <coughs> Good evening, Chair Sean O'Gary, members of the board, Superintendent Perry. Um, so uh, today we're giving you a presentation on some ongoing um, initiatives and ongoing processes that we've been sharing with you monthly at board meetings. And I'm excited to share that um, with the reimagining school discipline, um, the student safety work, the SIA, and the Student Success Act, that um, what we have to share today is a lot more about action than it is about planning. In the last six months, we've really been sharing with you um, first our vision and then our planning steps and then how we're doing with our planning. And now that we have some, some action steps to share with you, so we're excited about that. So let me start with the reimagining school discipline and, st and student safety and well-being initiatives. So right here what we have is just um, an overview. You've seen this before, but it's an overview about the scope of the work. And, and to put it shortly, the, the, what we're doing is we're, um, we have a priority in terms of uh, moving these processes and integrating them to keep our students safe, to create welcoming school environments. Um, our priority is to be um, culturally responsive, responsive, equitable, and also it's very important to us that we are able to elevate our safety um, without, and, and engage in these processes without compromising the safety of our students. So um, you saw this um, slide, a different version of this slide a month ago. And I want to um, share how we've made progress on our student safety systems and, and our conversations with student safety systems. So as you can see, we, we discussed defining the new relationship with our law enforcement. And really what we've done in this conversation is um, We've had conversations with law enforcement to make sure that we're able to provide, uh, um, that we're just asking deeper questions about what it means to be safe in school, and also having conversations about it with the building leaders and our safety risk and management system, um, uh, services to discuss uh, where we are um, needing to rely on our district personnel for areas of safety versus law enforcement, for instance, in areas of safety. I'll, talk, I'll unpack that a little bit more in the next slide. And then in terms of our reimagining school discipline slide, our uh, school discipline work, we are engaging in, in sessions with our districts that will really um, begin in earnest next week. Um, we're speaking with principals uh, and we're, we're continuing to engage students to learn more about what safety needs are. And then also we were continuing to work on our professional development work and we are doing the, the mapping and planning for what our professional development strategies will look like for next year. So for the student safety, um, the student safety systems, uh, we've met with law enforcement in the district attorney's office. We, we uh, had a, a really good <coughs> meeting with them last week. And uh, we really just had a conversation about, again, what are the needs for our students? Where are our blind spots that we might not be seeing or that we need to be uh, taking into consideration? And what our goal is to do is to, to redefine what our relationship is like with um, these organizations, whether it's law enforcement or even organizations like Liberty House to make sure that we're able to, to keep students safe and also have a, um, 
be able to address any emergency situations that might be occurring on campus, and also being able to train our staff on how to identify how to keep our students safe. Uh, so that's um, identifying when a student might be at risk, if there might be abuse going on, or, and also to, to be in, in tune with the student's um, social emotional well-being. So these are things that we're gonna be working with our, with our staff on, with our professional development. So uh, last month when we spoke, we talked about shifting the tone for, of how we approach discipline in our district to go from punitive to being more inclusive, uh, to take an approach that's, that's educational for students and that's restorative and, and leads to equitable outcomes. We're re reducing the amount of times that we are uh, removing students or, uh, from class or, or compromising their, their um, educational opportunities and more creating a, a, an environment in schools that are leading to increased inclusion and a feeling of welcomeness and well-being. And so we're continuing to, we're, so what we're doing right now with our um, MTSS team is we're really focusing on this philosophy of discipline. We want to be able to identify what that is, put it down in writing, and share it with our building leaders so that they understand what this philosophy is, which is to go away from the punitive and into the, the educational and restorative. We're, and so um, next year, we're going to have a robust professional development plan, and we hope to be um, ready to share that plan um, sometime at the end of next month. So we're, we're working in earnest with both our Office of Equity, Access, and Achievement, as well as with our MTSS teams to design a, uh, a, a RSD model. We refer to it as RSD, RSD professional development model. The rollout, and we'll be working with um, our administrators on the, the professional development. We'll be working with teachers um, and also classified staff as well that engage with students. Also, I want to share that we have an equity audit underway. And what the, the goal of the equity audit is to do is to share, to learn more about our systems that are inequitable within our school, um, highlight some of the areas where we're doing well and use that information to inform, inform our professional development planning. And um, lastly, uh, this, this uh, week, you would have received your um, first month's worth of, or your first version of what our uh, student safety uh, data will look like. And um, what we're hoping to do is, as the months go on, we can refine what the presentation of that form looks like, so, and also work with uh, the board on how to engage with that data so that um, we're being really transparent on the type of progress that we're making and we're also using that as a decision making tool as we as we move forward in this work and I think it's important to underscore that this work isn't a um, um, something that we're just going to be a big initiative for the spring of 2021 we see it as a multi-year ongoing process so um, we are going to have the group from NYU visit next week, um, and they're going to engage in, in uh, several listening sessions um, that are intended to engage our students and our staff about what it means to, to have this sense of safety and well-being in our schools. And so while we've already been meeting um, in, uh, virtually when they're in NYU with our building leaders, we're hoping that since they'll be in person, we're going to get more out of that, out of that visit that we get from them. And they're going to be busy. So when they arrive on Tuesday, uh, there'll be some preparation period. But um, we've already set their, their calendar. And they're going to be meeting with um, students and staff or district level staff from Wednesday through Saturday. And the outcomes that we're looking for in their visit, besides showing them what a beautiful state Oregon is, um, is to establish a, uh, the foundational knowledge uh, amongst students and staff of what restorative practices look like, um, to identify mechanisms that, uh, that promote safety and wellness from a student and staff perspective. And then they'll create a report that will help inform our reimagining school discipline um, PD and process, and they'll give us a recommendation on how to move forward with this work. They'll submit that to the superintendent, and we intend to share that in June um, of next month's board meeting. So that's it for that portion of our report. We have, have two more sections of reports to go over, but uh, I would like to take, um, take any questions. And again, looking ahead, 
We want to get a report to you in June. Um, we want to finalize our PD in June, and we want to finalize our student safety systems uh, agreements and um, revision of policy, and and um, and really be able to define what our safety safety systems will look like, so that our our leaders are clear on how we're going to keep students safe um, for the 21-22 school year. Thank you, Dr. Udusinat. Let's start with questions. Director Kylo has already raised his hand. Um, in your presentation, at one point, you referred to action planning with school leaders. Mm -hmm. Who were the school leaders? So we're, so we're primarily working with our high school principals, especially our behavior high school principals okay. that engage with, with students on behavior issues. Um, but and we're, we're also working with a couple of our middle school principals as well, because those are the groups that, that meet most consistently with, with uh, students on behavior issues. Okay. And, okay, later in the presentation, the next slide in fact, you refer to building leaders. Are they different than school leaders? Are building leaders different than school leaders? School leaders and building leaders are interchangeable in my presentation. Okay, that's, but you used both. That's yep. what I wanted to check. And at no point did I hear you really mention you were going to be working with the teachers. Yeah, well, but speaking... That leads to my next question. Is, your looks sounds like you're putting together a great plan to do all this PD. So what are you going to take off the plate from the teachers who are already loaded with professional development to get work this in as well? That's the piece of the plan I'm concerned about. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. And what we're doing is we're looking really deeply at our strategic plan and making sure that when we engage in this work, it actually was part of the plan all along because it integrates with what our strategic plan says in terms of fostering systems of inclusion in our MTSS work. So it's, it's just the way of formulating the way that we're going to move forward with an already, an already mapped out plan that we have. But I go back to my question, which is the question I asked when that first that plan came out, is what are you taking off people's plates to work all this extra in? So uh, the, your question is what are we taking off the plates? Yeah. Of the, and of the teachers. Sure. So this is a form of the MTSS work that we were already planning. So I, I, I think that it was already a scheduled element of the work that we intended to do with them in, in terms of for the so we have a fixed amount of professional development time that we're going to use so that will still fit within that scheduled amount a lot of amount of professional development so it's really about asking our teachers to look differently at, at how they approach um, how they approach discipline than it is adding something onto what they already do with discipline I, I understand I'm just not sure I'm fine. Director Lepole Pion, do you want to get close to the mic and just? Oh, sure. I mean, I don't have a ton of questions just because you answered a lot of them when we met. Uh, but I would just say thank you for the work that you're doing. I think that it's really awesome, and I'm really excited to see what comes out of this. Advisor Mebinton, do you have a question? Get close to the mic. I do, Jesse. Director Blasi, do you have a question? Director Blasi, I'm going to ask uh, Director Silva to increase the volume so that I can hear you. All right. You may want to come close to your mic. into account uh, cultural diversity. Uh, do, you, do you have a sense of, of that? Um, so I guess the question is whether or not 
part of that professional development will be around um, uh, educators' um, ability to recognize or be familiar with how uh, Director Blossie, how sorry, might is it possible to put your question in the chat? Even I will. Uh, Director Silva can't get it, and he's close to the. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Did you get it? Yeah. Um, that is a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. She's uh, he, she's gonna put it in the chat, and then we'll and Director Hyen, if you have a question, if you want to put it in the chat as well, and then we'll read them out loud. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. We'll read them out loud, and we can also post it on the website if these yeah, questions no. came up that way. Yeah, and um, do you, are... Somebody can read yeah. it for me. I can't see the screen. Yeah, we neither of us can see the screen, so. Thank you, Director Hyen. And if you have any other questions, you can always email it later. Professional development take into account cultural diversity when planning to planning for restorative practices. Thank you. Yes, cultural diversity, equity, diversity, and inclusion are are um, are our highest one of our highest priorities when it comes to framing out this professional development. And uh, just as a couple things, we have an equity coach that's part of our team to help being sure that we really have that cultural perspective. And then we also have been doing that professional development with Dr. Uh, Khalifa that keeps that really important cultural component uh, right next to the work. So we'll continue to have that um, con consulting and coaching for ourselves as we roll out our PD plan. We're ready to discuss yep. student investment account. Okay. What we're going to do is let's take a five-minute break, and then we'll regroup. Break. We'll take a five-minute break, and then we can come back for the next post. Okay. So whatever the time is, five minutes to, or like four minutes to seven. So we'll come back at one minute past seven.
presentation is, um, is focused on our Student Investment Act and our High School Success Act. And again, um, the focal point of this presentation is really to acknowledge the hard work that has um, been done by our, our district leadership and the, student, and the, um, the SIA Advisory Committee and, and taking what was a concept back in 2018 and turning it into a reality of, of real work being done to really invest in students. And so just as a refresher, um, the Student Investment Act um, in 2018 was an act that was passed, and I think initially it was for $200 million, and then it grew to $500 million. And um, the, the purpose of this, this funding was to uh, in, increase our investment in students, especially students who um, have been historically underserved, um, our, minority, uh, our uh, students of color, our um, our students experiencing disability, our students uh, navigating poverty, living in foster care, making sure that we had investments both in academic and, and social emotional investments to, to help students in this population be successful in school. And so the student investment account, um, as you can see, or the act was break, broken into three parts. The one part is the student investment act, which I'll speak about momentarily. The other part is the early, early learning account, which I believe Dr. West will speak about when I'm done. And then the other 30% is um, funding for ancillary supports. Some of it is to make sure that we're able to meet all the needs outlined in, in Measure 98 or the, the High School Success Act. Um, some is to make sure we have um, the appropriate resources to expand uh, food availability to, to students and families. And um, also to expand special programming. So um, again, there's the key, the, the, the key uh, purposes of the, of the SIA, which is again, um, mental and behavioral health needs and to increase student academic achievement and reduce disparities amongst the, uh, the focal populations that I, mentioned, that I mentioned earlier. And so in our district, we, um, first what we did was we assembled an advisory committee, and after we assembled the advisory committee, um, we engaged in a, a deep level of community and family engagement. Dr. Sproles was uh, very involved in, in having those engagement sessions throughout the 2019-2020 school year, and actually 2018-2019 school year, and it culminated in a plan uh, last year. And that plan has 11 strategies. And I'll come back to that slide momentarily. I wanna look at these 11 strategies first. So the 11 strategies are a, a blend between academic strategies, so you'll see language and literacy development, ninth grade on track, secondary English language development, dual language expansion, but there's also a lot of um, social emotional supports blended into this plan as well. So social emotional supports, community engagement, extracurricular activities, and more. Right, I think it's really important to, to highlight that our advisory committee, our SIA advisory committee, um, made the decision, and it was a very, it was a very um, intentional decision to dedicate 25% of the total expenditure uh, for the student uh, investment account towards uh, social emotional supports for students. So let me just give you a, a real brief overview of what the funding looked like. So the original SIA allocations in 2020 was 36 million, but remember because of the shutdown that got modified to 11 million for the 2021 school year. And so next year we're looking at um, $29 million uh, for our Student Investment Act. Of that, 202, uh, there'll be 202 FTE um, uh, added to our district to support students as a result of the SIA. So right here on this slide is a, is a representation of how the SIA funding and dollars is being spent. And something that I wanna share is that uh, Director Blasi mentioned earlier, she had a question about um, our equity lens and some of our, our long-term planning. And, I, and I'm, I'm really pleased to share that equity, diversity, and inclusion is really embedded into all of our strategies here. And so that's important for you all to know. And it had deep consideration from our, SI, uh, our SIA advisory committee. And one thing that we want to emphasize, even with our academics, was a true sense of belonging for students. And also we want to make sure that we, when we're looking at these strategies, 
there were elements that met the critical needs of those focal populations that we're trying to target with our SIA dollars. So right here is a representation of how many classified staff that we're adding to S, um, through our SIA, SIA dollars. So um, for 21, 22, so that's next year, not, it's not, um, we're adding 36 classified staff for a total of 68. And this is the, the types of positions we're offering, cultural responses specialists, translators, interpreters, community support and outreach coordinators, instructional assistants, clerical support, and LRC teachers. And the, the strategies that they're supporting are our language acquisition, our middle school math, our social emotional supports, our community engagement, our equity, diversity, and inclusion, and our continuum of supports through SPED. And so the representation for our licensed staff adds is 81 for the 21-22 school year for a total of 126 FTE. And those are classroom teachers, English, English language development teachers, school counselors, social workers, program associates. Um, and you'll see that our licensed staff represents 62% of our total uh, of our SI, our 21-22 SIA budget. And the strategies that our licensed teachers will be focusing on is our fifth grade reading, our ninth grade on track, our language acquisition, our dual language, our middle school math, social emotional supports, equity, diversity, inclusion initiatives, and our continuum of supports for SPED as well. And so that's, you know, I, I, you know my, my tone is a little subdued and I think it just undersells uh, the, 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 the really, the, the swirls, uh, I think it undersells uh, how much that we truly do have to, to celebrate for um, the SIA. Adding this much funding shows a true investment in our students. Uh, you know, Sandy Price is a, is a director who uh, worked really closely to, with our SIA advisory committee and, um, and they, did, uh, they, they commit a lot of time and effort to, make, to bring these uh, strategies to fruition and our leadership team worked really closely with our principals uh, to to um, put these uh, to 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 hire the to create these positions, hire the staff, and make sure that they're really impacting students and creating change for students. So it's just something that we're really proud of in our district. Thank you. Do you want to? Should we keep going yeah. and then come back at the yeah. end for okay? Yes, please. All right. Oh, keep going. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we'll talk about um, high school success. So just um, a quick reminder, and, and because we have a, a fairly seasoned um, board here that has been around for the onboarding of SIA and our uh, high school success, I'll just give you a quick reminder that the high, high school success, uh, also known as the Measure 98 uh, funds, were created to support a, a CTE, dropout prevention, accelerated options, um, especially with college credit, options for, for high school students, but also goes down to the eighth grade to help prepare uh, our eighth grade students for success as they become rising ninth grade students as well. And so I'm gonna go through each of these, the CT, starting with the CTE. So with the CTE, um, we did a lot of expansion. And what the expansion did is it, it complemented the investments that we had already made in, in, in career and technical education with our bond, right? So um, over the last few years, we've invested in state-of-the-art facilities um, at every high school. Uh, we highlighted McNary earlier, but every high school is, is, um, has either completed or is, is starting um, the, the process of, of really creating a state-of-the-art CTE facility so that every student has an opportunity to gauge in CTE. And so what the, the Measure 98 or high school success dollars did was um, it helped us to, it helped us to um, invest in ancillary materials and equipment that outfit our classrooms for CTE. But it also brought other, um, other classrooms that weren't necessarily CTE up to industry standards. And so we were also able to buy equipment that you see listed here like um, you know, forklifts, trailers, high school vans, um, to really help supplement our, our current investments in, in career technical education for students. Um, our, our high school success dollars also uh, help to support our um, MTSS structures. Uh, more specifically, it helped to 
to support our ninth grade success teams at each site, our community resource specialists, and also even helped us purchase vans uh, for alternative education to support with transportation. And it also helped us to um, create, or create positions for our Office of Equity and Advancement, again, so that we can do targeted outreach for students uh, that, were, that were in jeopardy of, of, of uh, not having success. As far as the students, uh, as far as the student success reports, it uh, it supports. It helps with our summer transition programming, credit recovery, prep buyout for additional sections, and college and career coaches. And at Roberts, it helped with the redesign. Um, it's, it helped to fund our additional case managers and additional licensed staff as well. Again, the goal is to put systems and structures and investments in place to to help keep kids connected to school and then to invest in students who we have identified as potentially being at risk of not having success or dropping out. And then there's our accelerated credit opportunities. So for our accelerated credit opportunities, um, it helped to fund our Willamette uh, teacher stipends for with a Willamette Promise. Um, it helped to, to, uh, to, for student fees for IB, AP, and um, dual credit. It also helped to um, support with fees for Willamette Promise. And again, Willamette Promise is the dual credit opportunities that students get while they're in high school. And then there is a senior launch, um, which we're really proud of, which is on the bottom slide. And the senior launch is when students who have met, fulfilled graduation um, requirements while still in their, their um, four years of high school have an opportunity to enroll in, in um, college classes while still being uh, Salem Kaiser Public School students. In 2021, we're able to enroll 175 students, and in the class of 2022 has up to 200 students enrolling in the senior launch. And at the middle school level, um, we're investing in the Paxton Patterson Labs. The Paxton Patterson Labs give us an opportunity to, or give middle school students an opportunity to engage in CTE, um, a rotation, so that they can have some experiences at the various CTE levels. And then from there, they could, when they get into high school, they may already have an idea of where their preference might be or areas that they'd like to explore. So it really is a great experience to help um, prime our, our middle school students for, for high school. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but um, there's, we, we tried to get our industry standard equipment up to, up to industry standard in our CTE spaces at the middle school. We're also able to hire um, CSOCs so as uh, outreach uh, specialists, um, again, to, to um, help support or prevent um, students from being disengaged with academics. And then um, it also helps to fund our, our eighth grade success teams and our eighth grade summer enrichment programs. And that is it for the SIA presentation and the Measure 98 pr presentation. How about if we take a quick yeah. uh, break for questions and Dr. West can yeah. finish with early learning. Yeah. We'll start with uh, Director Blasi. Director Blasi, do you have any question this time? I do have one do question, have one but it's a two-part, two part. not a two-part, oh, sorry, it's just tied back to one of the superintendent's uh, earlier presentations. So um, um, just looking at the, uh, the breakdown of the distribution of the SIA funding, um, and you know, it's just a good reminder that uh, we are still focused heavily on uh, the social and emotional learning of, of students. I, you know, that was such a big focus a year or so ago, and we, um, you know, the district has done really amazing work in this area. But it's just a good reminder for us that there's still a lot of work to do. Um, but you know, looking at a, a 35% investment of these funds, which are intended, you know, to to help provide that support, but then comparing it to what we're able to add in additionally for math and English and the other uh, core, core function. Um, so my question is, how, I'm going back to your, your comments earlier. Um, so when we have, um, you know, 38% of some of our, I believe, our middle schoolers, going back to the chart you showed earlier, uh, Superintendent Perry, um, that showed that, you know, 38% uh, of our middle schoolers are behind um, and 
a large percentage of them in uh, three or more grades in math. Um, I know I, I go back to this question all the time, but um, when we see that data about you know middle schoolers who are that far behind in math, and then um, just you know our ability to invest in in those programs. I guess that's not really a question. It's it's more of a concern um, and concern about how the district is allocating resources. It's just a concern in general that when kids get that far behind in math, um, you know, we know the likelihood of their ability to graduate on time. We agree. And we, we do have an investment in, in middle school math and the SIA. Uh, Dr. Sproles, can you give me the exact number of how many middle school math teachers do you remember? Is it 10? We can get back to you on that, but there uh, is duly noted, um, Director Blasi, we are um, investing in, in uh, middle school math, but importantly, we're also investing in, in both engagement and high quality instruction um, for, th those are our, our big focal areas for the middle school next year. Thank you. Director Hyen. Uh, no, uh, thank you, Director Blasi, that was a great question. Um, I don't have any additional ones right now. Dr. Goss, do you have? Dr. Kaido? Yeah, I, I have two. Uh, of the 81 additional licensed staff, how many of the classroom teachers are going to be used to reduce class load, class size? Do you have the, remember the strategies are in language and literacy acquisition. The, at the elementary level. I'm just asking how much, how are you, are you reducing class size or not? Is, I guess. Not with, not with the SIA funds. We're so not, we're not reducing, reducing class size overall. We're not, so we're putting in other people, but we're not reducing class size. So when you say classroom teachers, that's somewhat misleading because we're not really reducing class yeah. size. But classroom teachers so. can offer language and literacy support during reading time. That would be considered. But that doesn't reduce class size. Not for in the truest sense of the word. It can reduce the group size in during reading instruction. Okay, so these really aren't class, they're specialists coming in to help classroom teachers. They're not really classroom teacher teachers, yeah. as we think of traditional classroom teachers. Uh, Director Kylo, I would say it's a combination of both. So that some of them are classroom teachers in the traditional <laughs> sense who will push in during literacy blocks because there, there'll be push in and there's a co-teaching kind of an embedded model. Remember the big constraint to reducing class size in many of our buildings is extra classrooms. Right, I know. So this is an attempt to add licensed teachers to the mix in creative ways for targeted outcomes okay. without building new schools. Okay. And then how will the instructors in the Willamette Promise who receive the stipends be chosen? I think the, it's based on their, the classes and the classes being designated as available for Willamette uh, Promise credit. I also think they are um, voluntary in, but I'm looking so, at Suzanne to see if, I don't know if so she's first year, So first year teachers who we want to recruit to the district could be offered a Willamette Promise class to teach and get the stipend? I, I think it depends on the subject level. So having been a principal in a, in a school that offer Willamette Promise, if the um, principal and the district leadership designated Spanish as an area that would, would offer Willamette Promise, then it's not necessarily, um, uh, doesn't, doesn't um, seniority isn't, Part of that, it's it's the teacher who um, is I'm, I'm not teaching talking seniority. I'm talking just teacher. Okay, sure. Yeah. So I think to to Superintendent Perry's um, point, then is, it depends on the subject level that's going to be offered. And and for um, a lot of schools, it's you know, language arts, it's second language, it's, it's a lot of core classes that are offered. My experience has been it's whoever the the principal mm -hmm. or the building leader likes. That's my problem. So okay, go ahead. Director Lepol Pion. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Advisor Mabinten. Um, I just wanted to say these strategies um, seem really good, and thank you for building strategies that actually focus on students' emotional um, 
well-being and just proving and making it about students. Um, a lot of times we just talk about making it about students, but these plans are great. And, you know, we've made a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And I agree with uh, Director Blasey on her question, too. That was my question. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I, I have a question. Is there a way for us to start predicting, either from the elementary school level, who will probably need that credit recovery or who are potentially at risk for, say, dropping out, and where we may be uh, you know, investing on either getting them back or dropout prevention or dropout recovery? Because right now, what it sounds to me, based on the presentation, we are waiting till they are in high school and then we are putting this investment or probably middle school. Is there a way to predict a little bit early so that we can decide how much to budget the scale of the problem we'll be facing when they reach middle school or high school? So uh, the first answer is the um, high school success funds can only be used in eighth grade through 12th grade. So for those funds, that's all we were focused on because that's all they're allowable. So even if we said this group of fifth graders um, we think are at risk, because we often know who they are, those funds can't be used for that. So um, our multi-tiered systems of support structures do just that. And as kids go from third grade to fourth grade, we know which of those kids are in that uh, top tier and need the most intensive support. So when we've done those presentations around MTSS, that is the system where those kids in the top core are the kids we need to focus resources on, do it, as many interventions as possible because you want to get them out of that top tier and um, uh, performing at grade level. So we do that within our systems, but these funds can't be used earlier. So the, the, this is the reason I asked this question. So if these funds have a specific purpose, is this funds enough to deal with the actual uh, need in terms of how many students, for example, if they don't er, know how to read English by third grade, they're probably one way to predict the graduation problem, right? So are we having enough funds or uh, braided funds to ensure that we are capturing everybody? Or there is a, still a gap that is not being met? Well, so the short answer is there's still a funding gap. Um, there has always, there's been a funding gap for decades. The Student Success Act and the Measure 98 were the attempts to close the gap for the kids who needed it the most versus, you know, getting the funding at a high level for the whole system. So, um, and if you think about where we are in the legislature right now, we're at 1 point, or 9.1 billion. That's, if we, in its purest sense of the words and those dollars, it could be $22 million reduction. So, and that's the um, push and pull on the system every single year in the budget process. Well, thank you for explaining. And um, i fortunate enough that I, it looks cheap, like I have a cheap watch, but it's still, um, I have lifelines that are able to text me. And um, Director Orth, who works closely with our uh, Willamette Promise, just communicated that um, the, the, the criteria for recruiting uh, Willamette Promise teachers is three years experience and it's done on a voluntary basis. And then um, uh, Director uh, Biondi, share, who is a middle school director, shared that we have 16 math positions uh, that we're adding to the middle school. Cool. Thank you. Superintendent Perry, your next. All right, so uh, next we're gonna just talk a little bit about early learning. Uh, as a reminder, the Student Success Act had the SIA, a number of other statewide initiatives, and then high school success and early learning. So we also benefit from the early learning dollars to, through the Student Success Act. Thank you. So just a couple of quick updates here. Um, as a reminder, because of those extra monies, we were able to increase slots for Head Start and Preschool Promise this year, um, which was great for many of our families and our students. Um, we anticipate that we'll be able to maintain at least the same number of slots for this upcoming school year and potentially increase them as well. Um, we're expecting a funding update sometime in mid-June and we'll be able at that time to determine for sure what next year's slots looks like. 
We're also anticipating being able to offer some summer school opportunities to our preschool students. Again, we're waiting for ODE to release what that funding may look like. What we are tentatively planning for is a four week summer school for our preschool students. We may have to adjust that a little bit depending on where funding levels actually end up, but that's what we're planning for at this time. Um, and just to let you know, based on the anticipated funding for the upcoming school year. Dr. West, do you mind coming a little closer to the mic? Better? Thank you. Is this better? Okay, thank you. Um, based on what we anticipate for fun, oh, this is much better, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's better for her too, Director Bossy. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, who knew, Who knew, right? The microphone. Yeah, based on our anticipated funding for the upcoming school year, um, we do still have some spots available. So for families that are interested in either Head Start or Preschool Promise, we encourage you to go to our website or call our pre-K office to learn more about how to sign up students for that. Um, and just as an overview, you've seen a slide similar to this for the 1920 and 2021. Uh, slots available in our four different programs. This also projects what our 21-22 slots will look like if funding remains static. Again, there's an opportunity, a chance that that may increase slightly, in which case we'll be able to offer more spots. Um, but we're pretty excited about being able to maintain our current number of openings in our Head Start and Peaceful Promise programs and, of course, continue our title and teen parent program as well. What questions may I answer for you? Let's start with uh, Advisor Mebinton this time. Um, so there's a certain amount of spots, if I'm correct, in Head Start. Correct. Um, where is, how can I, oh, where's the equity lens with that? How do we make sure it's diverse? Yeah, that's a great question. So both Preschool Promise and Head Start are made available based on a percentage of the poverty level. So for, um, preschool Promise, it's families that make up to 200% of the poverty level. For Head Start, it's families that make up to 130% of the poverty level. And um, just because I was curious about this and looked it up myself, for some context, for a family of four, the poverty level is considered 26500 So 200% of that would be $53,000 a year for context. So. How that fits in with equity is that these two programs, the Preschool Promise and Head Start, are really designed for families who don't have other options for preschool. So this gives their students an opportunity to learn those school skills that we know through years of data and analysis are critical to success when a student enters kindergarten. Thank does, you. does that answer your yes, question? Yes, that answered it 100%. Thank you. We also uh, do a lot of our um, publicity in multiple languages. We yeah. have um, bilingual educators um, there as well to interact with families. So, so that's the other piece. It's how it's also recruitment. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Lepolpio. What's funny is you just act, answered my exact question. <laughs> so thank you. But I, I would just say, uh, just looking at this, just seeing the, just the numbers, how many kids were able to get enrolled. I mean, if we want an opportunity to help set kids up for success, I think it'd be really cool if the, if the state, uh, you know, invested in early, early learning. Agreed. Yeah. Thanks. It is one of the biggest investments I've mm -hmm. seen in early learning in my career. And then um, there's also some movement at the federal uh, yeah. level around universal preschool. Director Kylo, Director Goss, Director Hyen. Yes. Yes. Uh, so mine uh, is so not mine so much a question, but because we're talking about uh, preschool, uh, at the last meeting I had a question uh, about preschool. My son uh, had been in preschool in the district, but we had to pay for that. And I had a parent this week ask me the answer to the question that I attempted to ask in the last uh, board meeting which was regarding preschool in the district. So just for the public's uh, information, if you don't qualify for preschool promise or Head Start and you want your child to go to preschool, you are going to have to find a private preschool.
And we made that decision based on uh, facilities and the need for access for, that were in our, a couple of our elementary schools where we needed the space. And then our preschool programs, uh, we pretty well maxed out as many uh, preschool uh, places for the, these programs alone. So as that's increased, the tuition-based preschool that Director Hyen's been talking about, we've had to um, eliminate that, so. Thank you. Director Blasi, do you have a question? I hear no. Okay. I, I have a question. So with Head Start and Preschool Promise, are we able to bring all the children in this county and Hope County who would be eligible? Is there some kids who are being missed, either by the pediatrician or somebody who is not really sending them here? Yeah, we definitely do not have all students who are eligible enrolled in these programs. Um, does, does the county help us understand how many are not being, because if you really go with the vision of universal preschool is very important, uh, you know, zero to K3. Our, so is yeah. there a way for us to know what is the number of kids who are not being connected with our messaging or whatever it is, can we reach the pediatrician and somebody to send them this way? Yeah, I see well, you nodding your head. So yeah, so um, the short answer is we could, but generally we have a waiting list for the oh, program. Oh. So generally we can't serve the number of kids that applied. This year has been different um, in COVID and we've had slots, but generally we're here with between 50 and 100 students on waiting lists. Oh. Mm -hmm. The um, expansion of those grant dollars has really helped us have a smaller waiting list, but um, generally it's a waiting list um, issue. We have great recruitment strategies, but it's really hard to turn down um, kids. Yeah, I wish there is some way to bring the remaining. We agree, <coughs> we agree. I don't know, can there be some private endowment or some kind of private-public co collaboration to bring the remaining kids who are just left out? Um, for us, it's the dollars and the space. Okay. Um, so it's both. And it's also within our own um, community. There are commun early learning providers that, that provide lower cost uh, preschool options, but they also, it's always also about space. Thank you very much. Yeah, oh, Dr. Sproles. So, Dr. Chandragiri, I appreciate the question. I think it's important to note that, that we've had community supports around expanding mm -hmm. this, particularly with the Seymour Center, which is um, something I would love for the board to visit at some point. So it's a strong relationship with Catholic Charities. Mm -hmm. um, and and there's WESD has uh, classrooms there as well. So space is one of our biggest issues, um, but we're partnering with uh, community providers who really see the need as well. Mm -hmm. All right. yeah. Thank you very much. It's really important for our community to understand this is the most important foundational thing for the children's future. So it's, uh, there is some way to capture all the kids who are potentially ill. We agree. Well, we're going to go to the next action items. Is everybody ready for the action items or do we want to take a two minute break and Let's go. All right, let's go with the action item then. <laughs> the, this is the Apro, the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month Proclamation. Superintendent Perry, you're going to invite two presenters before we... All right, so we have two presenters to present the uh, proclamation tonight. Um, and I think we're starting with a video from um, uh, North Salem High School student Paul... Quash, who is, um, has submitted a video. And um, Paul, as a student, has helped us with the graphic that we are pushing out through our social media. And I know there's Paul, oh, Paul. but he's on in a video. Yeah. Um, oh, so he's there. helped us with a graphic. He's helped us with some of our messaging. Um, at some point, you'll see a poem he has written and performed that we're going to push out. And this is his video about the importance of um, this month and this proclamation. So with that, um, I will turn it over to you, Director McDaniel. So that's not him really. There we, no, it's... Hello? 
Hey, you hey look, everyone. Look My name is Paul Quach. I'm a junior at North Salem High School, and I am a Chinese, Vietnamese, Asian American student here in the Salem Kaiser School District. Happy Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. It's so important to me to have a month like this so that we can highlight Asian voices and their stories that were told as they immigrated and helped their students get to America and a new education. I'm really excited and thrilled that the Salem Kaiser School District has asked me to record a little blurb about Asian American Heritage Month and why it's so important to me. I think it's very important that we have an opportunity to share and a month to highlight um, our minority voices and Asian Americans being one of these minority groups. And together, as we can continue to learn and hear these stories, we can progress as a stronger community. And I believe like this year has been especially hard with all the coronavirus and all the stereotypes that have been occurred. But I think we have grown stronger as a community and this month will really allow us to really showcase these stories and bring attention to my community, the Asian Americans and the Pacific Islanders, and highlight our stories and showcase that we are just like everyone else and we are here a part of the community, a part of the school districts, and we are happy to talk and have conversations and get to know all of you. So once again, thank you for this opportunity and happy Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. All right, and the next uh, guest tonight is Kathleen Jonathan, and uh, she's been one of our uh, fabulous connectors in our school district with our Pacific Islander community. So Kathleen, welcome, and thank you for being here tonight. It's really great to see your face. Kathleen, we can't oh, hear your voice. I think you voice. might be muted. There you go. No. Still muted. Yeah. Mm. No, Kathleen, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying. Okay, I need to mute something because it's. I'm getting feedback. Okay, is that better? You know how many times this happened to me. You've witnessed it. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I had plan B because I knew my connection wasn't that great. Um, thank you for having me. Yago um, Joda, Chair Chandra Giri, Vice Chair Beto, Superintendent Perry, Board of Director Ro. In Salem Kaiser, in Chugujugun Perio and Salem Kaiser. And I'm Kathleen John Avan, in Jarbalilo, Chugurwan Kien, Ilo Salem Kaiser, and I'm Chuan Community School Outreach Coordinator, and I'm Ruin Majaro, in Palm Levoy. Good evening, Chair Chandra Gay, Vice Chair Bethel, Superintendent Perry, Board of Directors, Salem Kaiser staff and community. My name is Kathleen Jonathan. I work with Salem Kaiser Public Schools as a community school outreach coordinator for the Marshall East students and families. What a wonderful video we just saw. Thank you to student Paul Quash for sharing his experience. Paul's experience is one of many, and I invite you to really take the opportunity to celebrate with us and learn all there is to know about the variety of people who make up our Pacific Islander and Asian American community. May is Asian Pacific Her American Heritage Month, a time to celebrate Asians and Pacific Islanders in the United States. Asian Pacific encompasses all the Asian continent and the Pacific Islands of Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. Melanesia consists of New Guinea, New Caledonia, Vanuatu, Fiji, and the Solomon Islands. Micronesia comprises of the Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, Wake Island, Palau, Marshall Island, Kiribati, Nauru, and the Federated States of Micronesia. The following island countries make up, of, uh, make up Polynesia. New Zealand, Hawaiian Islands, Rotuma, 
Midway Islands, Samoa, American Samoa, Tonga, Tuvalu, Cook Islands, French Polynesia, and Easter Island. Throughout this wonderful month, you will find that we are family, we are parents, we are guardians, we are workers, we are employers, we are voters, we are friends. For me, I am honored to have an opportunity to connect with Marshallese families and students here at Salem Kaiser. They are part of our Pacific Islander family. In my role, I help students navigate the education system, provide them with the resources they need in school to be successful. I coordinate, sorry, I also provide families with community resources to help them with their basic needs. I coordinate student and parent involvement by assisting in the coordination of planning, implementing, monitoring, communicating, and evaluating activities and services for students, parents, and other community members. Tonight, we have a chance to honor our heritage and contributions which are often overlooked. Therefore, one month certainly does not offer enough time to explore our vast heritages and our significant contributions. But we can begin here and continue every day to make this a part of what we learn and share. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on our behalf. Superintendent Perry will introduce the reading of the proclamation by Director Ayan. All right, uh, with that, um, Director Hyen, you're gonna uh, read the proclamation first and then we'll go ahead and have a motion after that. Thank you, uh, Kathleen, for being here tonight. Uh, yes, uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Kathleen, and, and to the student who spoke. Uh, it's always an honor to do this particular proclamation. And as always, I apologize in advance for uh, mispronouncing certain names. Whereas Salem-Kaiser Public Schools is committed to reflecting the concerns and needs of the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. And whereas Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have played a significant role in America's history with their enormous contributions to science, arts, industry, government, and commerce. And whereas the term Asian slash Pacific encompasses all of the Asian continent and the Pacific Islands of Melanesia, which includes New Guinea, New Caledonia, Vanuatu, Fiji, and the Solomon Islands, in addition to Micronesia, which includes Marianas, Guam, Wake Island, Palu, Marshall Islands, uh, Kerbati, Nauru, and the Federated States of Micronesia, and finally Polynesia, which includes New Zealand, Hawaiian Islands, Rotuma, Midway Islands, Samoa, American Samoa, Tonga, Tuvalu, Cook Islands, French, French Polynesia, and Easter Island. And whereas traders from the Asia Pacific region reached North America as early as the 16th century, but the first significant wave of immigration began during the late 1800s, and whereas citizens of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, and Palu can live and work in the U.S. without visas and work permits because of a 1986 law called the Compact of Free Association, or COFA. And whereas a third of the Marshall Islands population has moved to the U.S. with the population growing exponentially in the Salem-Kaiser area. And whereas 5% of Salem-Kaiser students identify as Asian or Pacific Islander, and whereas 314 Salem-Kaiser students identify as Marshallese, and 310 students identify as Chukis, and whereas the achievement of Asian and Pacific Islander students is improving with graduation rates on the increase and dropout rates on the decrease, and whereas 
Salem Kaiser Public Schools is dedicated to providing resources to directly support continued achievement growth for Asian American and Pacific Island Islander students and whereas only 2.36% of Salem Kaiser employees identify as Asian or Pacific Islander. 33 identify as Hawaiian and Pacific Islander and 93 identify as Asian. And whereas Salem Kaiser is committed to expanding employment opportunities for advancement of historically underserved populations. Now, therefore, the Salem Kaiser School District Board of Directors proclaims May 2021 to be the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and urges our community to join together in celebrating our students and staff of Asian and Pacific Island heritage and in making this period of rededication to the principles of justice and equality for all people. Somebody moves motion. I'll, I'll make the motion that we. Oh. we well, Director Kylo beat you there. No, she can make the motion. Okay. Oh. Okay. 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 Director Hyen makes the motion and Director Kylo seconds it. Thank you, Director Kylo. For <laughs> approval of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month proclamation as read. Now let's open it up for any discussion. Advisor Mabinter. Mm. Um, I think it's important that this proclamation is going through just as we would do the African American one. Um, all students of color. You have to um, get closer to the mic. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> all students of color um, de deserve a, a voice and acknowledgement. So Thank you. I appreciate this. Director Lepol uh, Pion. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would agree with uh, Advisor Minton. I think she said it perfectly. I would also like to just reflect on the past four years of me being a board member. And uh, one of my favorite things that I've done in the past couple years is uh, when I was started getting invited to McKay's Islander Club. Uh, great kids, awesome kids. And as, you know, they're, that, this community of Islanders, which a lot of them are Marshallese and Chickies, uh, started growing. Like it was just the culture it is awesome. So if, if you guys ever get the opportunity uh, to go, uh, don't pass it up because um, there's some great kids. We got some great kids here in it's San Francisco. It's fun, Kaiser. too. They always have pizza. Oh, it's a party. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Director Kylo, do you yes. have? Director Goss? No. D Director Hyen, do you have any discussion? I just want to say half a day. And for those who uh, understand the language of Saipan, that's greetings. Blasi. I can just barely hear a bit, but no, thank you. I, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Uh, you know, I just was reflecting on this uh, proclamation. You know, the contributions of people of Asian heritage and Eastern thoughts to our nation is diverse from Buddhism to the nation's uh, civil rights movement all the way to the recent years, the people of Indian origin and have a nation have contributed to our nation in many different ways. Some arrived as immigrants while others sought, came here seeking exile. In the end, we are all tied to each other in a common destiny. I was reading about the 1956 Supreme Court ruled the Montgomery's bus segregation was unconstitutional. Shortly afterwards, King spoke before a crowd in New York City, and he said, in quotes, Christ showed us the way, and Gandhi in India showed it could work, end quote. King continued Gandhi's work. Representative John Lewis was another civil rights leader who studied Gandhi in nonviolence workshop, and he used some of those peaceful protest techniques later in his Tennessee. India is a diverse country with 1.2 billion population with many languages, to put it simply. I think you know, as a nation and our community move forward, we need to go upstream and focus 
on how we can really promote inclusivity, tolerance, understanding, and prevent conflict and bias. So with that, I would like to support this because I think it is a very important way to recognize and continue to recognize, as Kathleen said, it's not just for this month. This, there is a lesson in this. And we have so many streams of ancient wisdom and the cultural experience flowing into our Salem Kaiser School District and community. So if there is no other discussion, are we ready to take a vote on this? All right. Director Kylo? Aye. Director Hine? Aye. Aye. Director Lepol Pion? Aye. Director Blasi? Aye. Aye. Director Goss? Aye. And Chair Satya, uh, aye. And Vice Chair Bethel is absent. So with that, the proclamation, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month proclamation passes. And so the next item is vote on Larry Trott for Willamette Educational Service District Board of Directors Zone 5. We've invited Mr. Trott to join us this <coughs> evening or provide a statement. But we have not heard from him. Is that right, uh, Alice? All right. So I want to hear from the board. How do we proceed? Do we have a statement at least from him? Is he still running for the position? Yes, his materials in the board packet. Okay. Yeah. I move that we, uh, it, uh, let me just get the word here. We accept. I move that we accept, uh, we vote Larry Trott to serve on the Willamette Education Service District Board of Directors for Zone 5. Second. I second that. All right. So, Director Kylo beat you by 10 nanoseconds. Doesn't matter, whichever. All right. So, <laughs> all right, we'll give Director Goss this time, second. So, moved by Director Lepol Pion and Director Goss, second set. Any discussion on this? Go ahead. Uh, having served on the Willamette ESD budget committee the past three years, um, I would just say I've gotten to know him, and he does a good job. He's vice chair right now. Uh, meetings are ran very well. Um, they really focus on <coughs> kids and making sure that they're uh, servicing uh, the districts, which also reflects that with their, with their ratings from the districts that are getting okay. serviced. Um, some of the really cool things that Willamette ESD has been working on that Larry's been helping with is, for example, the Willamette Career Academy, which is basically CTEC before Marion, Polk, and Yamhill counties, which is super cool, um, as well as some other, other projects, things that they do, like our Willamette Promise program and some other things. And so he's done a great job, and uh, I believe he's the only one running for the position. Yeah. So, Any other discussion? Director Blasi. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I've uh, met uh, Larry Trot several times over the years, um, you know, doing audit work at Lamb at ESD and, and different um, different capacities. And and I agree with uh, with Jesse. I appreciate uh, Larry Trot's uh, commitment to Lamb at ESD and uh, the community. I would, however, and I, and I support his uh, uh, voting for him. However, I would like to see, um, you know, maybe next year or or so, um, I, I would hope to see some more interest in this role uh, because of the impact Willamette ESD has. Um, I know Larry Trott has served in this position for 16 years, and, and that's fantastic. However, I, I, I would like to see some additional interest from the community because the ESD plays such a, a pivotal role in this community. So, but, but thank you to, to Larry. Um, it would have been great to, to hear from him, but maybe, maybe the board can hear from him at some point going forward about the, the work at WESD since he is the school board's um, candidate. So. Uh, 
type it. The last part I couldn't hear. I, hear, I can't hear the last part. That's okay. Thank you. I think she's in support of. I, right. I'd go ahead and take a vote. Just show a thumb up. Show your hand. Okay. Yeah. So, so okay. I see everybody has voted in favor. No absence. Nobody said no. So it passes. We vote for Larry Trout. So next item: approve the sale of Rosedale property. Authorize the superintendent or chief operation officer as superintendent's designee to execute all documents and take all actions necessary to complete the property transaction with the proceeds to be recorded to the asset replacement fund to support the transportation investment package financial plan to mitigate future impacts to the general operating fund. Superintendent Perry, if there's a review of this item. Yeah, here's what I would suggest. Could we have a motion for the approval and then we'll open it up for questions? Motion second and I would move approval of the sale of Rosedale School. You move it. I would move the approval of the sale of Rosedale School. Okay, so Director Kaira moves. Is there anybody seconding? Second. Director God seconds. Let's open it up for discussion. Any discussion? Director Lepol Fion, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, I just want to say originally, you know, I was opposed to this, uh, but, you know, as a, simply just because I felt like we could have gotten a better deal to sale. Uh, but at the same time, you know, our board wants to move through with it. A majority of our board does. And so, of course, I think it's really important that uh, we try to act as one voice whenever we can. <laughs> so I will be supporting this. Uh, for that reason. All right. Any other discussion? No. Okay. Hearing none, can you show me those who want to support it a show of support? Raising your hand, a show. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So, so this passes approval of the sale of property as read as it was shared, passes unanimously. Director, Vice Chair Bethel is absent. Everybody else has voted in support of it. There is no, no vote. The next item is consent calendar. Is there anyone who wants to pull any item from the consent calendar? Move approval of the consent calendar is right. so. Second. Director Blasi, second. so you want to both? Who said that? Marty. The, Marty. Okay, Director Hyatt says that moves the motion to accept the consent calendar as presented. Anybody second? Uh, Marty. 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 It was Director ah. Blasi and, and Director uh, Hyatt. You're good. Yeah, yeah okay. I was the second. <laughs> okay, yeah. so Director Hyatt seconds. Director Blasi moves the motion. Any discussion on that? Hearing none, are we ready to vote? To show off. So I see one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Okay, the consent calendar as presented. All have voted in favor. Vice Chair Bethel is absent, so it passes. Is there any readings? Uh, yeah, no? There are no readings tonight. Okay. What if we take a five minute break and then we'll get back for that uh, standard reports? So it's about eight o'clock, five minutes past eight, we'll be back.
Okay, we are back again. Oh. Hey, friends. Hey, friends. We're going. <laughs> okay, we'll go to the item number nine in the agenda. Information and standard reports, Superintendent Perry, it's all yours. All right, so uh, in this section, you have the first um, attempt at the monitoring report. There's a couple of reports that weren't um, available at this time, which I think you knew. Um, and so we weren't planning to, to do any presentation on this at all, um, but we're just providing them in writing to you. Um, so I'll stop there. I don't know if there's um, specific questions or if we just want to move through the reports quickly. Superintendent Perry, may I suggest? Mm -hmm. What if they take the report and kind of review it and bring, bring their specific question, email them to you? That'd be great. Or that way they can read it. These are really involved reports, mm -hmm. which requires, at least in my opinion, a good understanding. And not to react on these reports. I just want us to be very, very clear. This is just the beginning. Once we start using this, then we'll have to go through the root cause analysis, try to understand a little bit more before we start making changes to the policy program. So please, this is just the beginning. This is like starting the, you know, your blueprint of your home. So please, <laughs> accept this report in that spirit. <laughs> uh, that way we will, this will guide us in making necessary changes. This is, and we need all community partners, everybody to really take it in that spirit. With that, any questions, quick questions? All right, but please get back with questions and suggestions. You know, this is really, folks have worked very hard behind the scene to get this, and I specifically want to say thank you to Superintendent Perry and your team. Mm -hmm. Hours have been spent on this, but it'll get better. All right, um, so of course, email me questions if you have them about the data report. Uh, the next report is the 2020-21, so this school year student investment account update. And the things you heard from um, Dr. Udosna Tata Knight were the 21-22 looking forward report. And um, just as a reminder, there's a couple questions that came up through the budget committee around um, are these one-time expenditures? So we had a number of positions that we funded this year. Those positions are rolling forward to next year plus some more. So because we have more money uh, next year, along with there are a few um, investments that are kind of the stuff and things investments like curriculum that are one-time expenditures, although there's dollars in the budget for more next year. So this is the uh, first uh, report. We have a final report to um, ODE that will be due. Um, I think we have to come back in October with that report to you before we submit it. Um, and again, this is very lengthy, but we put it in writing so you'd have a chance to see our strategies moving forward and what we've accomplished this year. There's also um, like a journaling exercise we do related to our strategies. And so you see a good portion of that here. And um, I think it would be great if you have questions, um, if you'd email those in and then we could um, respond to those at a future board meeting as well. With that, we move to 9C, the board meeting schedule. All right, so um, our next board meeting is not until June. Remember it was moved from June 8th to June 15th. And so in between now and then, we have a series of budget committees. Next week, we'll have our budget committee meeting on the 18th. Then we'll have a budget committee meeting on the 24th. Uh, both of those will take public comment. Uh, we will go on to a meeting on the 25th is, if needed move to the 26th if needed. So those are tentative. Um, the goal on the 24th is to accept any additional public comment and begin your deliberations uh, for the budget committee at that uh, point in time. Uh, so that's our meeting schedule uh, moving forward. As we get to the election next week, uh, I know we'll have um, a certain number of new board members and we'll start working through getting our summer schedule on the calendars after we get new board members um, in place. Uh, with that, um, I'll either open it up to questions or I'll let you move on to the next item. I hear no questions, so we'll move on to board reports. 
We'll start with Advisor Mabinton. Um, I got to go to church youth group for the first time since COVID started, so <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> um, it was actually like a whole bunch of students from like different high schools, so it awesome. was like different perspectives, and we just talked about how it is like leaving high school and what we're gonna do after. So that was like an eye opener and a lot of advice, like we gave each other advice. So um, I turned 18. Um, <laughs> whoop, whoop. Um, Youth group, I turned 18. <laughs> um, yeah, basketball. We officially started yesterday, it's been fun. Um, yeah, but that's, that's it. Very good. Dr. Lepole Fion. All righty, so um, on my on the Native American Student Success Joint Committee, um, we I met with our Native American Education Program to make sure that I'm being helpful and not just getting in the way. Uh, and I'm excited to continue this work alongside the district. I also have a plan meeting with the Joint Committee of Local People and Key Partners, set for the end of May or the beginning of June to strategize how we can do this together alongside the district. Um, and then second, the Houselessness Student Success Joint Committee. Um, I have. Next Wednesday, I have a meeting planned with a few of our community partners to bring kids with real and current past experience being houseless to the table so that way the Mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance can better serve the community. We will be monitoring, uh, mentoring, learning from, and building the relationships with these kiddos so that way we can truly serve our youth houselessness crisis and get these kiddos to stay in school. Um, on the Willamette ESD Budget Committee, uh, we had that meeting uh, this just about a week ago. It went well, we passed the budget, and then Willamette ESD partnered with Mountain West has created basically what's called, a, it's basically a CTEC, but for all of Mer Polk, Marion, and Yamhill counties, which we heard about that earlier. Just so you guys know where it is, this is the old Toys R Us building out off of Lancaster. It's over near my house. Um, and so we're going to be starting with our cosmetics and diesel programs, which is super cool, and has over 100 students from all over the county. This isn't just Salem-Kaiser, um, but, you know, all schools doing well helps everybody do well. And then I'm working... Um, to find good school board orientations. Um, so that way, because we're gonna have three new board members at least, and then we're gonna need to help set them up for success. Um, so that way I'll forward that stuff to the board and that's just stuff I've been working on. Um, and of course I'll send this to everybody. I just wanna put in the groundwork. I'm not trying to take it all over. Um, and then with the American Indian and Alaska Native Council, I've been reaching out to Oregon tribes to start a social media page as a way that I can start collecting stories and things within the tribes. It's gonna be a first easy way to begin to join our tribes together within Oregon and then start to build the relationship needed. And then next in my plan, if, you know, of course, if I'm reelected next Tuesday and get to keep my job, <laughs> it's gonna be to start a joint committee in the, with the state representatives of each tribe. So that way I can ensure that um, we, the work on the national level matches the needs of our tribes. And then, I'm, of course, I'm gonna repeat this process in the 11 states I represent. And then um, I began reading a book called Lost at School by Ross Green. So that way I can better understand school discipline. Um, and that's where the quote comes from, you know, well, kids do well when they can. Um, as we're looking at reimagining school discipline, I would recommend all school board members to um, begin educating ourselves so that way we can be um, supportive. And then uh, next meeting, I have my American Indian and Alaska, Alaska Native Council meeting. And then this Thursday, we have the Mid-Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance meeting. And I'll bring info in the next meeting for that. Uh, personally, I'm going to be graduating from Willamette University this Saturday, and then my little sister has her Eagle Feather graduation on Sunday. Um, and so sorry about my uh, work being a little bit short this month. Uh, I've had a lot of time being taken care of doing those things. So <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you, Dr. Lepolfion. Good job. Dr. Kylo. Uh, I completed the tour of uh, McKay and <laughs> South Salem. And I also got received a tour of Hayesville Elementary where I uh, saw the completed or completing work and uh, also got to experience a, a lockdown. Um, I'm sure it was because I was in the building, but that's another story. <laughs> 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 My God, is that true? That is true. All right, I believe you. Dr. Goss. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I went through a tour of South Salem, and I was so impressed with the finished work that was done in that building and what they're doing, and the various areas that they've built out or are building out, um, from auditoriums 
all kinds of things, and they're all right up to a top class operation. I was very impressed. The other thing I did was um, meet with my grandson and all his friends, and they are so excited to be back in school that you need to know one way or another they're ready to go. They're so happy to be back, and that was what I've done with my time. Good job. Director Blasi. Your what? Unmute. There we go. Um, I also took a tour of South High School, which um, it's so exciting because I live right near there. And to get to see the progress, Marty was there as well. Um, I think we were both, were, I, I shouldn't speak for Marty, but it was really, really impressive. Um, like Kathy mentioned, a uh, new auditorium, the theater auditorium, and all of that and where the uh, culinary arts um, program is going to be located uh, very cleverly right next to the theater so then they can provide um, food uh, for the events and just in incredible. Um, and the, the work, because um, I, I think I've forgotten that that project, um, just the massive size of that project and that we uh, didn't end up using you know, a CMGC um, someone to oversee the entire project solely um, through, you know, um, uh, to oversee the subs and all of that. So the coordination that that has taken um, and that, you know, project being on time and, and on budget from what I understand. So just absolutely phenomenal to see it in the community. Um, and then uh, just working on scheduling a time to meet with the new executive director of the uh, WID, WID mid Willamette Valley COG, um, uh, Scott Dodson. And um, I think Mike Wolf and I are gonna meet with him and, and just talk about uh, the district and the board. And um, he's just reaching out to all of the COG memberships and getting to know folks. And so uh, that should be coming up soon. So thank you. Uh, yes, uh, so I went for a tour with McKay, uh, or at McKay, and uh, I had been there a month before, and it was pretty amazing to see, just in a span of a month, how much uh, work they get done there. Uh, also, uh, as uh, Director Lacey said, yes, uh, we both took the tour at South, and it's, it's going to be awesome, and I can't wait to see it when it's done. Also, uh, had the opportunity to support uh, future farmers of America over at McKay. Um, I love it when they have their plant sale. It's a great deal and it's a great way to support our, our students that are in the agriculture program. Uh, usually the plants are on sale, I think every May and, and boy, just to get those peppers that are already, you know, like this big and uh, potato or not potatoes, sorry, tomatoes and things, it's just, it's just really good deal. So I hope more people in the community know about that and will continue and uh, start supporting that program. And it seems like there was one more thing, but I can't remember what it was. So that's it <laughs> for me. I went with the director Goss for South and McKay. McKay is going to look like a university campus now. Their library is going to be so beautiful and everything else that uh, the new CTEC for engineering, agriculture, and culinary, that's going to be like amazing. And they deserve it because for too long, <laughs> they were not having enough uh, space. So that's one nice thing. And I was also, it's so nice to see two of our board members graduating. So I was busy carving that little bowler tie that uh, <laughs> Director Lepolfion was wearing and it is his uh, tribe spirit animal. So. You know, it's it's such an honor. It's for that he asked me to carve. So I thought it was wonderful to be given that opportunity to do that and carve something and give it to you. And it means a lot to me. Thank you. I want you to know it's such a blessing for me to do that. It's almost like an offering to your tribe. Well, That's how I saw it when I was carved. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, advice, Mayor Binton, you're graduating, so. Uh, thank you. Congratulations to both of you. You've been wonderful role model for all our children and students and the community. So thank you.
And with that, I just want to say thank you all of you. I mean, just amazing work. Keep up the good work. We have been busy. So thank you. And the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>